Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I would like to first of all thank everybody for being here. Um, it's it's four o'clock. So I apologize for a little bit of a delayed start here, but we are here. Um, you are here with Adrian Whitevin for uh, Living with Wolves in Wisconsin. But before we get to introducing our speaker and getting to the topic of the day, I'd like to take a moment just to introduce this series and introduce myself. My name is Jennifer Summers. I am the Program Development Specialist at the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. And I help to organize and host these seminar series along with um, Hingstrom and Katie Sertini. And so this is, our, this is a seminar series that we host every spring and fall uh, along with it's part of the Wildlife 150 course, which is a course open to all UWSP students that focuses on wildlife and um, wildlife science and learning to live with wildlife, as the name implies. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Katie Sartini and Scott for their role in, in coordinating this. And I would also like to take a moment now at UWSP has an agreement with our local uh, tribes where every time we have a public gathering, we go through this, uh, this acknowledgement and virtual gatherings count as public gatherings. So I would like to take a moment to say, we recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. And so with that, um, this is the final present uh, seminar in this Living with Wildlife seminar series for spring of 2021. We had three other presentations and all of which are available via video on our YouTube, on the College of Natural Resources YouTube channel. You can just uh, go into YouTube and type in UWSP College of Natural Resources, or you can find them on our website at uwsp.edu slash WCW. So, um, and this one will be recorded as well but we would like to encourage you to go and watch some of these other seminars. They're very interesting topics, uh, really interesting stuff. So with that, I would like to introduce Scott Hingstrom, who is the director of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, and he will, just, he will introduce our speaker today. Thank you very much, Jennifer. I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here. I was running down the hallways to make it. Uh, <laughs> I was doing inspections of some of our lab facilities, but I was able to get here on time. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce Adrian Wideven to you, um, and he'll be speaking about wolves here in a minute. But uh, I did want to say that Adrian is, is one of those go-to people in the state of Wisconsin when it comes to wolves. He was a wolf biologist for the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources for many years. He coordinated a lot of the wolf tracking and survey programs that uh, were initiated here in the state that enabled us to uh, effectively and accurately count wolves in the state of Wisconsin. And since he's, he's become, since retirement, I should say, he's become a chair of the Timberwolf Alliance Council and, um, and is closely associated with the Sigurd Wilson Institute, uh, Environmental Institute, and Northern College. Um, Adrian has spoken for our group here in, in the past, and because he's so good, we had to ask him back for a repeat performance. So Adrian will be speaking with us on living with wolves in Wisconsin, from endangered species to hunted game species. Thanks, Adrian, and take it away. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. Thanks, Jennifer, uh, Katie, and, and Scott. Uh, so what I'd like to talk to you this afternoon about uh, just kind of what's been going on with wolves in Wisconsin in recent times, but go maybe a little through the history of wolves and how we've learned to live with wolves in Wisconsin. Okay, so talk about gray wolves and their return to Wisconsin and, and the return of gray wolves has been a conservation success story, uh, but we're still having to learn uh, many things yet about how to live with wolves. So uh, initially I'll talk a little bit about their biology and ecology, and then uh, go through a little bit of the history of how population has changed over time 
and maybe kind of end with the most recent wolf hunt and then uh, provide some opportunity to talk to for people to ask questions. So the gray wolf in the Great Lakes region, they're smaller than the gray wolves of out west out in Yellowstone and average males about 80 pounds and average female about 70 pounds. They stand about 30 inches at the shoulder. The overall color is, is kind of a gray color. It's a mixture of tans and browns and cinnamons and uh, we do get black wolves occasionally, but generally less than 5% of the population compared to like Yellowstone, where nearly half the population is, is, is uh, black. Um, but, so, but they're relatively large canid animals. And the animal we probably confuse with wolves most often are coyotes. Coyotes are quite a bit smaller animals, typically 25, 30 pounds or so in size, uh, about 20 inches at the shoulder. Uh, coyotes are extremely abundant in Wisconsin. We probably have 50, 60,000 coyotes, but probably only about, we only have a little over a thousand wolves. And after uh, February, maybe even a little bit less than that, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Wolves are carnivores, they're social carnivore. And as a carnivore, sometimes they compete with us for some of the things that we want to hunt or to eat. And uh, they are in our region, the white-tailed deer is the most important food item for them. Uh, some research by Dave Meach and Todd Fuller and uh, Rolf Peterson suggested average wolf in, in the Great Lakes region uh, consumes a, a, about 15 to 19 adult sized deer per year. But they also consume as many as nine fawns per year, a recent study in Michigan, and 13 to 15 fawns per year, a recent study in uh, Voyagers. Uh, the second most important food for them are probably beaver and uh, studies in, in Minnesota have shown that uh, the average wolf kills about eight to 10 beaver per year, ranging anywhere from zero beaver to some really good beaver hunters killing as many as 28. And that was research by Tom Gable uh, in Voyagers. Uh, other foods also include other, other uh, mammals, uh, snowshoe hare, uh, occasionally birds, uh, small mammals, but deer is probably, deer and beaver are their most important food items. So they're kind of a specialist for ungulates. With the feeding on deer and their impacts on the deer herd, they have somewhat of a, a trophic effect in, uh, on the ecosystems. And trophic ecology has really been studied well in Yellowstone, where it's been demonstrated uh, pretty extensively. But we are starting to get signals of trophic impacts of wolves, even in the Great Lakes region, finding that the interior wolf pack areas have a greater diversity of understory plants, of forbs, uh, less browsing on sensitive plants, less browsing on, on young seedlings, tree seedlings. So you've got a healthier, vigorous forest growing there. The edge of wolf pack areas where there's a greater concentration of deer, you tend to get a higher abundance of ferns and grasses that are unpalatable. So we are starting to see some of these ecosystem effects of wolves. Wolves probably have a culling effect in the deer herd. Uh, we're not seeing chronic wasting disease spreading rapidly into northern Wisconsin in wolf range. Uh, there have been several research projects suggest that wolves may be a factor re reduces the spread of chronic wasting disease and other diseases. So they are starting to have some ecosystem effects. Wolves are, are pack animals. The pack basically is a family unit, uh, adult breeding pair, traditionally referred to as alpha pair, but that's kind of get, going out of style and now just referred to as just a breeding pair. And the pack then it consists of the pups of the current year, yearlings from previous years, and sometimes older animals. Occasionally unrelated members, uh, adults will exist in a pack, but for the most part, the pack consists of, of, a, uh, of, of a family group. And the territory of wolves is generally about 20 to 80 square miles in our area, averaging about 50 square miles, which is relatively small for gray wolves compared to places out west or in Canada where it's often many, several hundred square miles. Uh, the wolves do defend their territories in several ways. They do set marking around the boundaries and in the interior uh, with uh, urinations and, and defecations. They do vocalizations with their howling. Uh, a wolf how wolves can hear each other howling six or more miles away in forested environments. And if you do the geometry on that, that gives you about 115 square mile area or larger that they can defend just by howling and they use active aggression. So this is a, a, a raised leg urination, which is a, the scent marking behavior of wolves where they urinate on the banks uh, within the middle of their territory and along the edges. And uh, 
Scats are often uh, dropped in the middle of uh, roadways or trailways as an additional marker. And you can see kind of the scraping here, the bottom of the paws has scent glands that also pro provide additional scent uh, at that site. So all of this is providing smells for other wolves to, to let them know there, there is a pack in this area. Uh, and these are also helpful for us surveying wolves because we driving along seeing this, you can right away tell you're in an occupied wolf pack area. Uh, if the scent marking and howling doesn't work as far as preventing packs from trespassing in other pack territories, active aggression is used and wolves will attack and occasionally kill trespassing wolves within their territory. And in fact, in areas where people don't control wolf populations in places such as Isle Royale or Yellowstone or Denali, the most important mortality factor on wolves are other wolves. So this shows a map shows some of the pack areas where I'm living in Northwest Wisconsin. This is from about a dozen years ago, but it really hasn't changed all that much. So the thing we see with pack territories is that there's very little overlap in the territory boundaries. Now we used to use VHF radio collars for doing most of this work and uh, work with GPS collars and showing that there actually is probably a little bit more overlap than what we had initially thought uh, when we're getting a lot more frequent locations, but there still is kind of a boundary area, no man's area where neither pack spends a lot of time, but where there's a higher risk of being attacked by the, the adjacent pack. So wolves are born within packs, but most do not stay in their home territory, their natal territory all their lives. Many eventually disperse, especially when they're yearlings or two-year-olds, in part to avoid inbreeding and to, to find mates, they establish their own territories or join new packs. And in these dispersals, the average distance is about 30 to 40 miles that they travel before they join a new pack or start a pack of their own. But we get some movements of over 400 miles and the record movements of wolves are close to a thousand miles. So this uh, graph, this map shows some of the long distance movements that we've uh, detected in the Great Lakes regions, wolves coming out of Wisconsin and coming out of the UP of Michigan. Uh, a Michigan wolf that made it all the way down to North Central Missouri, a Wisconsin wolf from the Black River Falls area made it all the way down to halfway down the state of Indiana. Wolves from uh, Michigan making it all the way into Ontario or into uh, Manitoba. Just recently, a disperser from the central part of the UP traveled through northern Wisconsin, through uh, central parts of Minnesota and into uh, Manitoba and then back into Minnesota before it, it got killed along the way. So the annual cycle of wolves, uh, February is a time when the breeding mostly occurs. The female normally will be in estrus for about a week. Uh, and she has only one estrus a year. So if she doesn't get bred during that estrus period, she won't have an opportunity to have pups again until the next year. Uh, and the estrus normally are in, in late January or in February. Uh, and and uh, the pack during this time period is mostly in kind of a nomadic mode where the pack is traveling as a group. They're fairly cohesive, but during that, that week of, of uh, the estrus period, the adult pair occasionally will wander off by themselves. So the female will start spending time at her den in, in mid late March to prepare the den for the birthing to occur in, in April. Occasionally they will start working on dens even in the fall, but most often it's, it's probably gonna be March or the middle or late part of March. And then the pups are typically born in, in the den in, in April. Um, Average litter is about five or six pups, can range anywhere from one to nine or 10 pups. Uh, the pups remain at the den site for most of the first two months of their life. Uh, this is the period while they're still totally, almost totally dependent on their mother's milk. And at the end of the denning period, the end of those two months, they are weaned. Uh, they do start coming out of the den after about three weeks or short periods of time, but still rely heavily on the den site as a protective uh, cover area. When the pups are about two months old, the pack moves them to their summer rendezvous sites. These are sites used from early part of June until the end of September, early October. And a pack may have two or three to as many as nine or 10 rendezvous sites in the course of the summer. Often these are beaver meadows, openings in the forest, areas along rutted uh, logging roads, sometimes in a more closed canopy forest, but often they're more open areas. 
and the pups are left behind at these places while the adults go off to hunt. Uh, when we do summer house surveys and we get responses from pups, this is a, these are the likely locations where we're gonna get the responses from when the pups are at these rendezvous sites. So the pack is very defensive of the pups at the time they're at their rendezvous sites. Uh, after the pups are uh, old enough, by the end of September, early October, they no longer need to be kept at any specific site and the pack becomes nomadic within their territory and travels as a group, as a unit throughout their territory from early part of October until the end of February or into actually in the end of March until the next denning period. So throughout that winter nomadic period, the pack doesn't have any specific uh, home sites. They, they'll stay at a kill until they complete a kill and then move on to uh, until they make their next kill. Uh, this is also a time period when most surveys are done of wolves in part because of the, the co cohesive pack structure that they're all together as a group more often. So those are the times it's, it's easiest to get full counts of the packs. So if we look at our region, when Europeans first contacted the area, Wisconsin and the adjacent states of Michigan, Minnesota, all of it would have been wolf habitat. There would have been a rich diversity of ungulates that wolves could have fed on. In Southern Wisconsin, Southern Minnesota, and Michigan would have had uh, white-tailed deer, bison, uh, elk, elk especially in the more open forest savanna areas, bison in the prairie areas of southern Wisconsin and westward into Minnesota. Going a little northward, they would have also had moose available, and in some ex further north, they have some caribou throughout the forested region, but to some extent also in the prairie regions would have had beaver as a food source. So a very diverse environment, a healthy uh, place for wolves to live. Uh, I, I don't know whether packs were as big as this pack uh, in Wisconsin. The typical pack nowadays in recent times is average pack in midwinter is about four wolves and the largest pack we typically detect is about 10 to 12 wolves and the, and the pack shown in this uh, slide, I, I think this is somewhere in Siberia uh, of 25 wolves, um, uh, but perhaps packs that large might have occurred in Wisconsin when we had bison herds and we had elk in, in the state. Uh, we do have elk now again, but only a small population. So wolves did share the landscape with the native peoples of the area. And as uh, as you mentioned in the beginning, uh, yeah, Stephen's point, you're right at the at the home homelands of the Menominee and the Ho Chunk people, where I am in <clears throat> northwest Wisconsin, the home areas of the Ojibwe, and earlier on it was the Dakota people. Uh, so about mid 1700s, we had uh, these native peoples living in the area. And for most part, they got along fairly well. They, they didn't have problems living with wolves at the time. They probably occasionally hunted wolves for fur and used wolves for ceremony and uh, religious purposes, cultural uses. Uh, but for most part, native peoples had very little impact on the wolf populations. Europeans arrived in Wisconsin and started settling in the state in the 1800s. And throughout the 1800s, we see a decline of the wolf population. The, the, the territory of Wisconsin had some bounties in the 1830s and 40s, but a regular bounty system started in 1865 with the state of Wisconsin that lasted almost continuously till 1957, paying people to go out and kill wolves. And throughout that time period, we see the population declining. A population that may have been at three to 5,000 at the time of European contact to uh, disappearing from the state nearly by 1960. So several things happened in the 1970s uh, with uh, um, the, the Endangered Species Act, wolf populations did start spreading back into the state in the mid seventies. Wolves were never totally eliminated from Minnesota and that provided a source population for Wisconsin once they received adequate protection. Then also the State Endangered Species Act provided high levels of protection that allowed wolves to again return to our region. Starting at fall of 1979, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources started a, a monitoring program of the state wolf population, which is a, still an ongoing program. So the first year of counting wolves would have been 1979-1980. And the methods for counting wolves have included radio telemetry, collaring, wolf, capturing wolves in the spring and summer, putting radio collars on them, following them year round with airplanes on a weekly basis, in, that, in recent years, that's transitioning to GPS satellite collars, less use of 
airplane flights, but this was the original way, way and probably kind of the gold standard for counting wolves because then you can get to see the collared wolf and its pack and get solid counts from the air. But most years, not all packs are radio collared and in recent years, even less than during the early years of colonization. And the department relies heavily on snow track surveys, which it were started right that first year as well. Uh, in 1995, we added a volunteer component to this the track surveys. And uh, as many as 150 volunteer trackers, citizen scientists assist over a dozen or so DNR wildlife biologists and, and technicians in tracking wolves in the wintertime. So it doubles generally uh, the number of, of miles that are surveyed each winter. The department also relies heavily on public observations to get an additional sense of where wolves are occurring in numbers. In early years, that was mostly based on people's observations and reported observations. Nowadays, a lot more of it's coming through trail cameras, including programs such as the Snapshot Wisconsin program. So the, the monitoring system, the survey system being used was referred to as a territorial mapping system. The attempts were to try to locate every wolf territory across the state and determine how many wolves existed in each territory. And this map shows uh, the 2012 territories where the purple represents packs that were being monitored by radio telemetry. Blue packs had been monitored by radio telemetry in previous years, but during that year uh, were being monitored by snow track surveys and the yellow were packs that are being monitored just by snow track surveys uh, uh, completely. So this map uh, is no, we no longer, the department no longer shows this map in part because in 2012 wolves became a game species so the details of the exact areas where, where each pack is located is no longer being displayed and just general maps are now shown of wolf pack areas. So we see uh, with the return of the wolves in Wisconsin in the mid seventies, a slow spread across Northern Wisconsin and then eventually into central Wisconsin. So the light blue colors here are the first place they moved into the state. The first packs were extreme Northwestern Wisconsin in Douglas County, we see the light blue there. But shortly after the packs arrived there, they also arrived in Lincoln County in North Central Wisconsin, kind of just north of Wausau. Uh, and from there, the packs have just sort of spread out. And so by 2020, we have wolves across all of the north woods of Wisconsin in the central forest of Wisconsin and a corridor following the Wisconsin River system. So the management of wolves in Wisconsin has been based on two different plans and the, some work being done now on updating the last wolf plan. In 1989, a wolf recovery plan was developed for the state, which set a goal for achieving a downlisted population, remove it from reduce it from endangered to threatened when a population of 80 or more, more wolves existed for three or more years. And there were 12 recovery strategies within that plan. In 1999, a new wolf management plan was developed which set a goal of achieving a population of 250 wolves outside of Indian reservations and a, a management goal of 350 wolves outside of Indian reservations. That number outside of Indian reservations is just slightly less than the statewide count. And the reason it was being reported that way or used that way is because the state does not have management authority on reservation land. So the, the goals were based on numbers of wolves counted outside of reservations. And there were 14 management strategies developed within that plan. There were some slight modifications made to that plan in 2007. And there were several efforts made between 2009 and 2014 to update the plan. But as wolves went back and forth on the endangered species list, those efforts were tabled at the time. Uh, a new effort has ju will just be starting this summer, this spring and summer. We'll talk more about that in a bit. So, this graphic shows uh, the growth of the wolf population in comparison to the various state management uh, goals. Uh, so, and you see two different lines here and uh, going from a popular, it was when wolves were first surveyed in 1980, we counted 25 wolves. The most recent survey, we counted 1,034 wolves as a minimum count of wolves. The minimum counts of those are actually detected through one of these, those three surveys. Uh, the, the green line represents a statewide count and the blue line represents a count outside of Indian reservations. So from up to 80 wolves, are, they were considered endangered, 80 to 250 are considered a threatened species. And the, and the 1999 wolf plan set a goal to achieve a population of 350 wolves. 
at a time there were less than 200 wolves in Wisconsin. And the assumption is the population would probably stabilize close to that level because there would be more. Uh, the assumption was that the carrying capacity was about 500 wolves at the time and that federal delisting would occur about 2000 and there would be a lot more flexibility as far as managing the wolf population. Both of those things did not occur. The, it turns out the carrying capacity was quite a bit higher, uh, probably about 1,250, and the, the federal delisting took a lot longer and has been a kind of a back and forth effort. So this graphic kind of shows uh, the growth of the wolf population, contrasting the growth of the wolf population to various federal listings. And the pink are the periods during which, which wolves were listed as endangered, excuse me, the yellow, they are down listed to a threatened species where the state had some flexibility to allow some lethal controls on livestock depredations. And the green represents periods when wolves were totally delisted and the state had management authority and included starting a, a wolf hunting season in uh, the period 2012 through 2014. Uh, we just, uh, we, wolves went back on the endangered species list in, in 2014 and uh, we just, uh, are, we're delisted again this January, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit here. But we see the population growing from 25 wolves in 1980 to 1,034 wolves in 2020. So one of the things that is also changing is the counting of wolves in Wisconsin, which, as I said, had been done using a minimum counting system. The department is now going to be going to a occupancy modeling system which is more of an estimation of the total population with minimum counts. You always assume you're missing some animals with the population modeling system. You're assuming you're estimating the actual number of wolves existing in the state. And so the solid line represents uh, on 2018 and 19 and 20, the estimated population and the most recent one in 2020, it's about uh, 1200 wolves. So about 15%, 20% more than the minimum count uh, was, was detecting. Uh, what you see there, the, the, the box around that solid line represents the standard deviation and this, the dashing lines represents a 95% confidence interval. The circles represent the minimum count. So indicating minimum counts did, uh, were within the 95% confidence interval of a, the counting system uh, and represented a good, low estimate of the population. So with the growth of the wolf population, we've also seen uh, an expansion of some of the problems that wolves can occasionally cause. Uh, we, this graph shows the number of complaints received by USDA Wildlife Services. In Wisconsin, USDA Wildlife Services, a federal agency, acts as the agent for the state as far as conducting control on wolf depredation for doing wolf depredation management. And so they have 800 numbers where people can call them when there's wolf issues. And the blue represents the number of complaints. The red represents the numbers of actual depredations or verified wolf complaints. And so you see that for every complaint, only about half are actually caused by wolves. Numbers of farms where their actual depredations uh, peaked about 2010, but declined uh, to a low point after the the, the 2014 uh, uh, delisting period when hunting and trapping were allowed, but also there was active depredation control activities and uh, uh, USDA Wildlife Service had the ability to use lethal controls. We see the numbers of farms decline uh, qu quite rapidly during that time period. We see it starting to increase again, but not as drastically as it had been at the high point in 2010. Similar trends for the actual number of cattle killed uh, peaking in 2010 and 11, declining during the period of delisting, increasing slightly after the de delisting again occurred. Uh, prior to uh, two th the, the delisting and the downlisting in 2003, problem wolves were generally moved across the state. Uh, I want to emphasize that wolves were never brought into Wisconsin. We never reintroduced wolves into the state. It was a natural recolonization, but we did move wolves across the state for depredation management purposes. And they were generally moved into national forest areas. Uh, the, the pink shows the areas where wolves were moved from and uh, the direction where they were released. And the blue represents movements afterwards. So 
once they were released on the landscape, they generally moved to fairly long distances. Uh, but uh, after 2002, the department stopped translocating problem wolves in part because the landscape was pretty well filling up, but also there were opportunities for using lethal controls after that. And this graph shows the number of wolves that were removed uh, each year. The blue uh, bar represents the number of wolves. The red represents those that are euthanized. And in the early years, uh, they weren't being euthanized and they were translocated, but later years, they were being euthanized. Uh, unless they're listed as a, a, unless they're delisted or unless they're downlisted or by special permit, the DNR did not have authority to euthanize wolves except in human safety situations. And uh, so th the ups and downs are partially to do with when the, that authority existed and um, uh, whether or not uh, the department was able to use lethal controls. Um, human safety issues have also occurred over time and, and, and those sort of peaked also in 2010, 11. Um, and I, I should point out human safety issues are situations in which wolves are showing lack of fear of people or coming closer to people. They're showing some bold behaviors. None of these have actually been physical attacks, but there have been re records of wolves attacking people in other parts of North America and other parts of Eurasia. These attacks are relatively rare. They're usually habituated wolves, wolves that have been fed by people, uh, but there is that possibility. And so the department does uh, carefully monitor when wolves are losing their fear and, and, and displaying unnormal, uh, abnormal behaviors. Uh, so one of the things that, uh, that Wisconsin DNR, USDA Wildlife Services has, uh, has done probably more in this state and than almost any US state is the use of non-lethal controls, in part because the state has been very limited in its ability to use lethal controls. And the non-lethal controls can be fairly effective, but uh, they often do need to have some backup system. And since 2014, there hasn't been any authority until starting again this year to use lethal controls. So mostly non-lethal controls have been used across the state. These are some of the examples of the kinds of non-lethal controls that have been used. The flattery, the flagging used to putting around uh, pastures to scare wolves off, and that can be fairly effective in keeping them off. Putting electric wires underneath the barbed wire fence at the base and then having to clear those areas of vegetation to make sure the electricity keeps running. Using uh, sound devices, uh, recordings of all kinds of things, other wolves, uh, noises, helicopters, people yelling, uh, and these can sometimes be triggered by special radio collars as well, although you do need to catch the wolf then. Flashing lights can be useful at times and guard dogs. But all of the non-lethal methods probably also have limitations and wolves can learn and adapt to some of these. The other area of concern for wolves are their impact on, on dogs and interactions with dogs. But I should point out, not all interactions are negative. In this case, the, the dog owner was more concerned because his dog was getting too friendly with wolves. Uh, this is an example of a wolf that was feeding on a deer carcass about a third of a mile from my house, a deer I had found about a week earlier, and I'd set up a trail camera to see what, what predators were visiting the site. And I was walking out to this site with my dog, walking in some dense balsams, and all of a sudden I lost track of the dog. And about 50 feet ahead of me, I see this big brown animal. And I yelled for my dog, and all of a sudden this wolf turned around, looked at me, and the next scene I saw was this. Uh, the wolf just right away ran away. Uh, my dog uh, hunted a lot of areas of the National Forest in the Clam Lake uh, cable area for 14 years at English Center. Uh, we encountered wolves, I think, three times. And in all cases, it was like this. The wolf just disappeared once, once it saw us. But there are cases where wolves do kill dogs. And the more common situation are with hunting dogs, the hunting hounds that are used for hunting and training on bears are the most common uh, dog depredations in Wisconsin. Uh, Wisconsin does allow for the training of, of hounds on bears in all of July and August. And this, as you may recall, is when the wolves are also at their rendezvous sites and are very protective of their pups. And so this ends up being a period where quite a few dogs do get killed every year. It's been averaging about 20 dogs per year uh, since about 2006. 
Uh, there was a little bit of a decline in 2012. Uh, that was a year that uh, uh, the, the issue of use of dogs for hunting wolves was in the courts and it seemed like people were more reluctant to report their wolf depredations on dogs those years. And then we get a jump in, in 2016 when it jumps up to 41, when uh, the department removed uh, any kind of fees for training your dogs on bears. And a lot of people were apparently experimenting with their dogs, uh, training on bears. And that year there was a high kill on, on dogs, but it, it came down again after that. So we don't really see any population, wolf population effect here. It seems like uh, since between about 2006 through 2019, it's been hovering right around 20 dogs per year. The, the other dog situation are pet dogs. And, um, and this is kind of more followed along with the growth of the population until about 2010. And after that, it's, it's kind of declined and, and fluctuated a little bit more. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly why that's happening. And maybe in part, it's because people are just kind of learning to live with wolves on the landscape more. Uh, so we had some more attacks earlier on when people were not used to wolves in the neighborhood and just learning some common sense uh, practices. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those at the end here. So the department provides a really nice map, interactive map that this is an example of the 2020, the depredations in Wisconsin, the red represents wolf depredations on, on hunting dogs. And those tend to be in the more larger blocks of public land, areas of highly suitable wolf habitat. The green areas represent livestock depredations. And we see a cluster along the Lake Superior shoreland areas and a cluster in central Wisconsin, and then a few kind of scattered across northwestern Wisconsin. These tend to occur more in more marginal wolf areas. So in 2012, wolves were again delisted. Uh, it would have been the third time they're delisted. And uh, they remained off the endangered species list for about three years. And at that time, the delisting was done for the whole Great Lakes region, uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota, and the surrounding states. Uh, that delisting then allowed the department to authorize landowners to shoot wolves in the act of uh, attacking pets and livestock on their property, which is again the situation now with the recent delisting. Landowners also were able to get permits to shoot wolves. They were coming, any wolves coming on their property if they had a history of depredation problems and all these, the wolf carcasses were turned over back to the department. 2012 also was the start of wolf, first wolf hunting and trapping season. Uh, this is sort of designated by the legislature. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't have as much input by scientists and department folks as we would like to have seen. And it was kind of an overreach of legislation that was much more aggressive than needed to be. Uh, it did allow for both the hunting and trapping. It did allow for the department to uh, determine quotas and permits and harvest zones. Uh, the, the statutes determined when the hunt would start and when it would end. Initially it was October 15th through the end of February. Uh, although the, uh, each zone did, could be a, given a quota and if, if the quota was achieved, the, the zone would close sooner. And uh, the starting date was changed after 2014 to the first Saturday of November. There was also a requirement that uh, hunters and trappers report their wolf within 24 hours after they harvested it. So this graph show, this table shows the result of the hunting seasons in 2012, 2013, 2014. And uh, the zones, zones one, two, and five that are shown in green represent kind of the core wolf areas. Those are the places where uh, the, the quotas tended to be kept low because this is kind of the source population. The quotas were allowed to be higher in zones three and four, more marginal wolf areas and areas that are perceived to likely uh, have higher risks of, of, of conflict, of depredations. And then zone six kind of represents the rest of the state, which is considered mostly unsuitable wolf habitat and there was fairly liberal control on wolves there. And so we see in 2012, 117 wolves were harvested. The next year, the population remained about the same, about 800 some wolves. In 2013, 257 wolves were harvested. That year, the population, the next year, the population dropped to 660, so it dropped a bit. 
the quota was the quotas were reduced the next year to try to stabilize the population and 154 wolves were harvested and the, the, the harvest act or the population the next year actually went up to 746 so the reduction of the quota uh, allowed the population to, to increase again so over the period of the three years of hunting and trapping seasons the wolf population only declined by eight uh, percent one of the other interesting things are that when the seasons closed um, the first year most of the seasons closed in December and later part of November by two, in 2013, a couple of the, the zones started closing at the end of October. By 2014, uh, four out of the, the six zones open up in, or, or were closed by the end of October. One of the, the hunting methods that was allowed is the use of dogs for hunting wolves, but it's only allowed after the firearm deer season, which in Wisconsin ends at the end of November. And so most zones were close to any kind of a hunting trapping season before any use of hunting with dogs was previously allowed. So our most recent delisting that just occurred January 4th um, it shows uh, the wolves del being delisted across, gray wolves being delisted across the rest of the lower 48 states, except in the Mexican wolf areas of Arizona and New Mexico, which are still con considered highly endangered and the Northern Rockies, which are already delisted, which were delisted in 2011. But the rest of wolves across the, great, the lower 48 states were delisted in 2021. Previous delistings have just been for the Great Lakes region. So this one is a little bit broader than has been previously done. And with the delisting, there were lots of pressures for the department to again, hold a wolf hunting season. The department initially requested, decided to wait until next fall uh, various groups, including Timberwolf Alliance, had recommended to do so, but because of a lawsuit, was forced to hold a hunt uh, yet in February, and in three days' time, uh, the 218 wolves were harvested. The actual quota that was set for the population was 119 wolves, uh, but nearly double that number of animals were actually harvested. Um, uh, and the vast majority were harvested with, do with dogs, as I said earlier on, dogs were, had only limited usage, but were extensively used in this more recent hunt. Uh, some little limited trapping and some hunting with bait and, and calls, but mostly use of dogs. Uh, a little over 50% were males, uh, the age composition, 9% were pups, 51% yearlings, and 39% adults and 1% unknown. Over 2,700 people applied for permits, uh, 2,380 people were offered opportunity to buy permits, but only 1,548 actually bought permits. But this still was larger than what the department initially recommended. But uh, when the quotas for this harvest were presented to the Natural Resource Board, the governing body for the DNR, they actually doubled the number of, of permits to be issued and resulted in a high number of permits out there, resulting in about one and a half hunters for every wolf in the state and as many as six hunters for every wolf pack in the state. So this ended up being a very aggressive hunt, uh, resulting in uh, over harvest of the wolf population and it's it caused some, some real concerns. And uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that at the end here. But uh, over the years, I think we've learned a, a lot of things of what we can do to live with wolves on the landscape, uh, avoid feeding wolves or feeding pets outside in wolf areas, avoid feeding deer in areas that might attract wolves, don't allow dogs to run at large in wolf areas, turn lights on and accompany dogs going outside after dark, avoid den or wolf kill sites with dogs, learn wolf sign tracks and scats from other sign, don't leave carcasses of dead animals exposed at home or farm sites, stand tall and be aggressive to any wolf not showing normal fears, report any bold or tame acting wolves to the DNR. Uh, the, there's more details of these on the DNR website. And if, if you want to support wolf conservation, uh, I'd urge you to support groups such as the Timber Wolf Alliance, Timber Wolf Information Network, Wisconsin Green Fire, or other wolf organizations. Uh, get engaged and stay informed in the wolf harvest planning, wolf planning process, which is just starting. Write and talk to your legislators. Uh, we may want to get our wolf hunting season changed so that instead of requiring the DNR to hold a wolf hunting season, it would allow the DNR to hold a wolf hunting season or the DNR may hold a wolf hunting season. 
encourage your congressperson to support the Recovering American Wildlife Act. That would do a lot for wolves and a lot of wildlife. Volunteer as a wolf tracker or wolf hauler, teach other people about wolves, report wolf observation, and encourage others to do so as well. Uh, the Department of Natural Resources has a public comment period right now from April 15 through May 15 to, to make uh, comments about the next fall's wolf hunt and about the new plan being developed. So this is the start of the whole planning process. So I urge anybody interested in that process to get involved. Um, and um, Wisconsin Green Fire is just coming out with an assessment of the wolf harvest this last uh, uh, February. Uh, goes into a lot more details than I was able to cover in the talk here. But again, this, this harvest was forced upon the agency, the DNR, by lawsuit, uh, kind of a rush job to have it get a quota set up and was uh, had extensive use of hounds, which traditionally is not a hunting method in anywhere else in North America and turned out to be very aggressive as far as reducing or uh, killing a lot of wolves in a very short period of time. And with that, I will open it up to questions. Well, thank you so much, Adrian. Very interesting. A lot of information there. So normally this is where we would be hearing lots of, of clapping. And um, so we'd like to encourage folks, if you have any questions to go ahead and please enter them in, in the chat. Um, so we could do, we, um, we could do that now. Uh, so if you want to go ahead and enter your, enter your questions and Scott, um, wondering if you're still there, if you wanted to uh, assist me with the, with the Q and A, we could go back and forth like we usually do. Um, otherwise I will, um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, so we got a question from Eileen Ribbons and who asks, uh, do you think that part of the quote over harvest is due to the 24 hour reporting rule? That probably was one of the factors. So uh, yes, uh, the, the department had, there's both a 24 hour closure period after when the department is able to close a hunt. So um, once the department realizes that, that the quota is gonna be achieved, the department has to have a 24 hour notification that, the zone, that the, a zone will be closed. But hunters have another 24 hours to report their harvest. So, uh, so it's, it's 48 hours after the closure start that people uh, would have still have an opportunity to almost to hunt wolves and, and be if they don't don't get caught after that the the, the, period, the hunting season ends. So yeah, the 24 hour closure is probably excessive and something we would like to see reduced. Great, thank you. Uh, let's see, Scott, we're working on it. So uh, thanks for your patience. Um, so another question here, oh goodness. Um, let's see, why did the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board double the wolf permits? It's a question from that Trina was, Fleur. Yeah, and not, I think the main rationale being given was that because uh, uh, it looked like there was gonna be only six days for hunting wolves and the feeling was because uh, there was such a short time period that the hunters were not less likely to be successful. So uh, the, one of the members of the Natural Resource Board decided to, to double the number of permits to be used. But yeah, that probably was a big factor resulting in the over harvest we saw. Hey Adrian, I'm unlocked now. So um, okay. another question for you. Are there any estimates of numbers of wolves poached annually? Uh, we've done some modeling. Jen Stenglen did her PhD work on a lot of that, and it averages out a, about 10%, just a little bit under 10% of the population annually is poached. It varies somewhat over time. In the early 1980s, it probably was quite a bit higher. It declined to quite low levels in the 1990s, but it seemed like in the 2000s, it started inching up again. And in recent years, we it's probably increasing again. We're probably seeing higher levels of poaching again. But at the average year, it's just a little bit under 10%. Wow, that's, that's a large number. Um, let's see. Uh, it seems that over the past, or this is from 
Ali Scott, who's asking, it seems that over the last 10 to 15 years, wolf conflicts have overall declined or stabilized, even though wolf populations have generally increased. Are wolf conflicts not related to wolf population size? What are your thoughts? I think during early years, they could be as the population is rising and wolves are entering new landscapes, uh, then I think there's more of a chance that there's gonna be uh, increases in depredations. But as the population start to stabilize, and controls start to be placed, combination of non-lethal and lethal controls and landowners and people living in wolf range start picking up practices that, that cleaning up carcasses more carefully, keeping the fencing up more, uh, monitoring their herds more carefully, being careful where you run your dog, that lots of things. I think people sort of learn to live with wolves and, and, do, and do these various things that probably reduces some of the depredation. So yeah, over time after the population stabilizes, I think the depredations can de decline. And we're hoping that now that there's more flexibility and controls that landowners can do some lethal controls that wildlife services is able to apply some lethal controls that will further bring uh, depredations down. Here's a question from Jody related to methods of research. Is there a reason why you wouldn't use chips and not collars? The wolves are chip, uh, but the, the chips are, you have to be right next to the wolf to be able to read it with the chip. Uh, yeah. You can read it, check it with the airplane from a couple of miles away and with the satellite collar, you can be sitting at their, at their desk. <laughs> okay, here's a, a question from Shelly asking, uh, do you think harvesting in February causes more pregnant females to be trapped or kills more breeders than non-breeders? Like, is this a, kind of a selective harvest? I think that probably is the case. Uh, what during the fall harvest that it occurred, the, the average animals uh, uh, average about 50% young of the year or pups, about 25% yearlings, and none of those would have been breeders and about 25% adults. In the winter harvest, <clears throat> we're looking at, at 38, 40% adults and almost 50% yearlings. And by winter time, some of those yearlings would be starting to become breeding females. So, Yes, by harvesting in the wintertime, you will be removing a lot more breeding animals. This question from Jeffrey, and it's a bit of a long one. Um, why do you think wolves moved from the northern third of the state to just the central Wisconsin area um, through what appeared to be one corridor? Um, and then he follows with, do you think it, it's a habitat suitability preference issue um, or perhaps a human disturbance distribution? Uh, issue? Well, um, yeah, with dispersing wolves, they'll travel over huge areas, and that corridor is kind of where they settled, but we're sure wolves are probably traveling across much of the state. Um, we did do habitat suitability analysis in, uh, in, in the 1990s and again in the early 2000s, and yes, there is a big block of land in central Wisconsin that does show up as being much more suitable wolf habitat areas that are large blocks of forest land, uh, large blocks of public lands, low density of roads, are all factors that contribute to more, more suitable wolf areas. So, so in part it is, yeah, there is more suitable habitat. Along the Wisconsin Riverway, there probably are some scattered wild areas in the river itself, probably riparian vegetation provides somewhat of a natural corridor. Following the Wisconsin Riverway, you've got the Mead wildlife area nearby, you've got the near Stevens Point there. So you've got uh, various wildlife areas, uh, wild lands along the way. So it does provide a, a good corridor for wolves to travel near. Uh, here's a question from Rachel asking, uh, do you believe hunting wolves in areas of conflict with livestock helps mitigate de depredation or does that result in removal that is too randomized? I, I think uh, one of the philosophies with a zone system is to try to apply more control in areas where there's more problems and reduce control in areas where there's less problems. Unfortunately, the, the kind of harvest that occurred this last winter, uh, this February, the bulk of the harvest was in large blocks of public land where the benefits to reducing depredations were probably pretty minimal. The other thing that Wisconsin does have uh, during a fall hunt and uh, any person who has uh, depredation problems on their land and have USDA Wildlife Services uh, assist them with 
uh, removing problem wolves or uh, they get payments from the DNR for missing livestock or killed animals. Uh, they have to open up their land to wolf hunting and trapping. So that ap ap uh, applies more pressure on the wolf population in areas where they're causing problems. Unfortunately, with this winter hunt, none of that was occurring. So, uh, so we didn't have the benefits of that kind of control. So the way it was hunted this winter, it probably provided very little benefits for any reduction in depredations. So there's a question from Matt asking you to bring out your crystal ball. What are the chances that number one, the use of dogs for hunting will be prohibited? And number two, the running of bear dogs midsummer will be prohibited. Well, I don't see it happening with our current legislation anywhere in the near future. Uh, uh, the current wolf hunting regulations, the use of hounds are part of the state statutes that the DNR itself cannot change. So, so it, it's, there's a requirement that DNR will allow the use of hounds. The only limitations are that hounds can't be used until the end of, uh, of the firearm deer season, so late November. So that would mean if, if hunts were held earlier in the fall and zones were closed uh, because the quotas were achieved before they reached that time period, use of hounds would not be authorized. But if, if hunting periods extend in those time periods, they would be. I suppose somewhere off in the future, it may be possible there, there, there would be greater restriction than the use of hounds, but I don't see it in the current political climate happening anytime soon. Uh, here's a question from, from Jody asking, uh, this winter I saw lots of tracks near my cabin. Should I report this? Uh, it's, it, the department is always interested in getting reports of observations uh, and especially if you can get a count on it and relate it to a specific location. If you got information on how many wolves there are, where they are, yeah, the department's always interested. And there's a place right on the DNR website where you can report those. Question from Gail, and they keep coming. <laughs> uh, do you have any more information on studies that affect of the effect of wolves on CWD? The main research on there was a modeling work done by Margaret Wild in, I think it was early 2011 or 12. And the modeling work suggested that the chance of uh, that the presence of a wolf population could prevent or slow down the spread of, of chronic wasting disease. Uh, the other uh, evidence in, in our area, or, or I guess in other areas, uh, there's research done on cougars that show that cougars uh, are about three times as likely in Colorado to kill deer infected by chronic wasting disease than, than human hunters. So there is a selective factor for cougars and uh, predators such as cougars that are ambush predators tend to be less selective than, than uh, coursing predators such as wolves. So wolves are likely to be even more selective than cougars would be. So that's the second set of evidence. The other evidence is just the distribution of where chronic wasting diseases in Wisconsin and the distribution where wolf packs are in Wisconsin. The two overlap hardly at all. So. Those are our lines of evidence, but we don't have actual direct data of wolves and chronic wasting disease together in the same areas to demonstrate that wolves are, are preventing the spread, in part maybe because wolves are doing a good job. Wow. So uh, well, there was a question, I think I can answer this one, the, the acts you suggested to write our legislators about, uh, if I recall, that was the recovering from, uh, I'm sorry, rec recovering, recovering America's American wildlife. wildlife. Yes, it just, I think was introduced into the, uh, either the House or Senate the last day or two. Um, and it would provide a large amount of funding to states for helping manage state wildlife species, game and non-game species. So it would help as far as monitoring wolf populations um, and allow for the latest technology and, and techniques used and as for many other wildlife species as well. And just one more time, that was uh, the Recovering American Recovering Wildlife Am Act. American Wildlife Act, yes. Yeah. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I have a question from Jack that was started but it wasn't completed. So I'll just ask Jack to resubmit. A uh, quick one from Jody. Uh, my brother thought he had a wolf on his farm in Pepin, Wisconsin, is this possible? Well, if you looked at the map we showed of, uh, or I showed of the dispersal that wolves from northern Wisconsin have made it into Iowa, Illinois, Missouri, uh, Indiana, 
Uh, so it's certainly possible almost anywhere in the state, potentially a wolf. And some of the Pepin County area, that western part of Wisconsin, there's some pretty good dispersal habitat in that Cooley region. Uh, we've had detected movement of wolves through that region in the past. So there have been several wolves that have also been killed. I know in Buffalo County next door over the years. Uh, and not too far from there, the wolves are in the Central Forest region in Eau Claire County. So uh, yeah, it, it's certainly possible in Pepin County you could see a wolf. This is a little long, but this is really interesting and very important, I think. A uh, question from Rachel says, uh, the Timberwolf Alliance does not oppose wolf hunting. Many environmental groups shut down at the mere mention of wolf hunting and call for relisting wolves. How can managers build trust that wolf hunting can be accomplished sustainably like it is for many game species and not be used as a vehicle to keep wolf numbers as low as possible? Wisconsin, Idaho, and Montana are providing very poor examples for belief we're believing that states can manage wolves appropriately. Yeah, unfortunately, I think this winter hunt probably didn't help matters. Uh, uh, I, along with Timberwolf Alliance, I belong to an organization called Wisconsin Green Fire and both organizations, that's our big push and as well as members, some of us in the Wisconsin Chapter Wildlife Society is getting science, using science for managing wildlife populations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we are seeing uh, way too much politics in wolf management in all three of those states. But I think it's still possible by managing the quotas. And we did see that during the time period that uh, wolves were previously delisted, just managing the quotas by designation of the zones, uh, managing the number of permits that in 2012, 2013, 2014, wolves were being harvested in a sustainable fashion. Idaho and Montana had been harvesting wolves in a sustainable fashion. Now in the last, just in the last few weeks, there's talk of very aggressive controls, but their populations have been relatively stable since they were delisted uh, 12 years ago or 10 years ago. Um, and the Wisconsin wolf population remained relatively uh, stable during the times that it was being hunted. So it can be done, the tools are available. Um, it's, I, we just wanna try to encourage, uh, try to keep as much politics out of wolf management encourage uh, uh, allowing state wildlife agencies to actually do most of the management with public input. I see Jack was able to get his question in. It was a biological question. How does a non-breeding wolf attain a breeding status? So there are two methods. One is being a disperser and, and dispersers, they're normally dispersing when they're reaching sexual maturity and encountering a member of the opposite sex and starting a pack of your own. The other is uh, joining a pack that has lost one of its breeding pair. And if, if the member of the breeding pair that, that died is the opposite sex of the disperser, they might be able to join that pack and become the new breeder there. The third alternative is being a biter within your own pack. Uh, when one of the adult pair dies, that pack will allow a strange wolf to join them that strange wolf joining the pack may choose to breed with another member of the pack if they're, if they're reaching sexual maturity. So it would give an opportunity for, and this has happened more often probably with females that they could become a breeder in their own pack if a new adult male joined the pack and instead of selecting her mother, selected her as, her, as a new breeding partner. I think the next two questions are kind of related, but I'm just going to start with the one. Um, it says, is there hope to relate, or <clears throat> excuse me, is there hope to return wolf and deer harvest decisions to DNR scientists rather than the Wisconsin Natural Resources Board? Well, the, the Natural Resources Board is the governing body for the Department of Natural Resources. Uh, there, what, I, I guess there's hope too that uh, diversification of that board and uh, uh, the current governor will be selecting new members of the board uh, this spring, possibly, and uh, hopefully they'll, he'll be selecting people that have strong conservation backgrounds. So, uh, yeah, the, the, the Natural Resource Board is the governing body for the DNR. The DNR doesn't govern itself. It's, so, uh, but the, the, the Natural Resource Board, there are seven members that are selected on a, uh, uh, a sliding scale or a uh, that uh, by the governor, by each governor, so that there's overlap from previous governors generally. And, uh, and if you have one governor in for two terms, that, then that governor is going to have more, more representatives on the Natural Resource Board. But uh, 
but yeah, the yeah, I guess is writing your legislators and encourage them to recommend somebody for the Natural Resource Board and encourage a governor to do so. I think Adrian probably addressed that next question. It was very closely tied to the Natural Resources Board. And we're trying to not to make this necessarily a political forum or anything either. Um, I'll just follow up with the next question from Joey. Um, could a bird hunter legally kill a, do a wolf that was attacking his dog, his or her dog? Technically not. Uh, if you're in uh, Wisconsin, currently does allow people to shoot wolves in the act on private land, on your land, uh, but not on public land, uh, depending. So I guess it depends on circumstances. If you're hunting on your own property, yet yeah, technically you could shoot a wolf defending your dog. Uh, on, on public land, technically you could not. Um, all the hunting I've done with my bird dog in many places where there's some of the densest wolf populations in Wisconsin, I've never had to encounter that. And I, I know of all the do hunting dogs that have been killed or injured, I think there's only been two or three that are bird, bird hunting dogs in bird hunting situations. So that, the, the nature of that kind of hunting, the hunter being so close with your whistle, your calls, your constant communications with your dog. A lot of dogs have bells on them and beepers. So uh, under those circumstances, uh, the chance of an attack would be extremely rare. Do you anticipate the fall harvest quotas to be reduced dramatically because of the February 2021 harvest was significantly over quota? Based on what is known now, what would be a reasonable quota for tw November 21, February 22 uh, period? I, I, I certainly hope so. At this point, I wouldn't want to put a number on it yet. I'd like to look at uh, some analysis of the population, uh, some uh, modeling of what we think might have happened to the breeding populations, perhaps conduct some summer house surveys to get a sense for pup production amongst packs in the state and how pa packs are doing after the hunt. Uh, so I wouldn't want to put a number on it, but I, I think we'd want to keep it very, very low. Uh, we are required to hold a hunt of some sort, but I'm hoping that we can keep it at it with a very low quota system. Another question on research methods. Does Wisconsin set up trail cams to monitor wolves like the Voyager Wolf Project does? Not so specifically. Uh, I think trail cameras have been used kind of uh, sporadically or um, uh, use maybe to uh, at a uh, site where there's a kill to, uh, just to see if wolves are in the area. Uh, but the department is probably taking advantage of the Snapshot Wisconsin program, which is a citizen science program that's distributing cameras across the state. So it's kind of a secondary way that these cameras are provided to the public. They are DNR cameras and they will probably serve also as part of the monitoring of the wolf population. So it's not done directly through the wolf program, but the wolf program certainly benefits from this ongoing Snapshot Wisconsin program, which has gotten cameras all over the state. Okay, it looks like our our last questions uh, is, a th wait, sorry. Uh, sorry, is it possible or beneficial to create a genetic database that tracks the genetic diversity of the wolves in Wisconsin to ensure fit animals, possibly by using samples from hair snacks? It probably wouldn't be a bad thing. We've, we've done genetic sampling kind of sporadically in the past. Uh, we had a graduate student from uh, Ontario do uh, an analysis of genetics of wolf wolves in Wisconsin, Michigan, Minnesota some years ago. And, in general found that we had a fairly diverse, healthy wolf population, but uh, I'm sure there's there's usefulness for continuing to do additional genetic research in the state. I'm gonna take a little uh, poetic license here and, and pull together some of the questions and just ask you, Adrian, what in your mind would scientifically sound and socially acceptable wolf management in Wisconsin look like? Well, I think uh, management based on uh, uh, recognition of caring capacity, social science surveys of public uh, attitudes, uh, support for wolf conservation, um, recognition and, and updating perhaps of suitability and uh, habitat analysis, um, allowing some public harvest based on, uh, but trying to stabilize the population uh, to, uh, uh, reduce conflicts, uh, 
uh, allow for some sustainable harvest of the population at levels that uh, that uh, reduce conflicts, but uh, uh, don't necessarily drastically reduce the wolf population. Um, as far as like an actual number, people have sometimes asked how many wolves should we have? And uh, at this point, I think we're better off just concentrating wolves on the landscape and manage the population that exists. And we can perhaps uh, determine uh, on an annual basis whether the wolf population should be stabilized or reduced and, and stabilized, reduced in certain places. There's probably plenty of places where uh, it's, it'd be fine to allow the population to fluctuate more natural, other places where uh, we'd want to have a little bit better control. I'd like to see portions of the state close to uh, wolf harvest to provide kind of more of control uh, uh, that uh, our harvesting of a wolf population is kind of a grand experiment in a sense and any good experiment or, uh, should have controls in place and unfortunately we have very limited control in places where we're not harvesting wolves and it would be useful to have more of those and those would play well into wolf conservation. I think uh, providing more opportunity for the tribes to protect wolves around their lands that currently the tribes are not allowed to, uh, or the they're, they're, the wolves are closed, uh, hunting is closed on reservation lands, but they have no control beyond the border of the reservation. And most post wolf packs overlap outside of reservation lands, uh, authorizing some uh, buffer zones around reservations to better protect those packs and allow the tribes to more fully protect wolves on the reservation lands. So I guess something that recognizes the cultural, the democratic process, the scientific values and, and the ecological values and encourages to maintaining populations at levels that provide the uh, optimal ecological values of wolves on the landscape. Wow, that's a, a tremendous all encompassing answer to a very challenging question really. And, and I know we're well past our time. Jennifer's giving me single signals here. Um, <laughs> I just want to say, Adrian, thank you for showing up and and, uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. It was a fantastic presentation. Well, I encourage you. you to look at the chat here because there are all of these accolades from people coming actually from all across the United States here. Oh. And so uh, uh, people are wishing you well and thanking you for the great work that you did today. So well, I just want to say thank you. I'll turn it back to Jennifer. She can close things out. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> Yes, I just repeat what Scott says. Thank you so much for joining us. There's, like he said, there's lots and lots of good stuff coming through the chat. Um, lots of lots of things saying thank you. So we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today about this really important topic. I think that you know there's been a lot of interest, especially with the recent developments in Wisconsin here, and you know wolves are charismatic species, and so we I always appreciate a chance to learn more. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. And I hope that maybe someday we can we can have you again. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Adrian. Thank you. Thank and you. Thanks, very much. everyone else. Yep. Yeah, bye.